Today's class, we will be discussing Ernest Hemingway's short story, Hills Like White Elephants. You can again find this short story in your Broadview anthology of short fiction or find a copy of it online. So let's start by discussing the author in a little bit more detail. Ernest Hemingway was born in 1899 and he died in 1961. Um, his reputation is, again, he's considered one of the most significant American authors of the 20th century. And while he's most often remembered for his fiction, he was also a noted journalist. Uh, in his career, which, again, is very illustrious, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1954. But perhaps he's also well known for his reputation. He has somewhat of a notorious reputation as kind of a womanizer. He's been more married five or four times and he is also known for his sort of stereotypically masculine or manly persona. He is very adventurous and heroic and he wrote articles about fishing and bullfighting and his uh, sort of carousing with women and drinking. So he had a lot of uh, a very exciting life and full of sort of um, adventures throughout his life. So some of the exciting events that he took part in throughout his life. Um, he was a journalist growing up so he began writing for the Kansas City Star uh, when he was just graduated from high school. He went on to go to the First World War where he drove an ambulance for the Italian front. Uh, in World War I, he was severely injured while he was helping a fellow soldier. And this writing, or this uh, experience in his life would go on to inform his writing of the work A Farewell to Arms. Uh, following this period, uh, he would relocate to Paris and marry his first wife, Hadley Richardson, in 1922. And he became a foreign correspondent, so he was doing journalistic writing for Toronto Star at this time. And he wrote about the Greco-Turkish War, as well as travel pieces that, again, talked about bullfighting, fishing. So all those sort of manly uh, adventures that he would partake in. In this time period, he was also became a sort of active member of a sort of literary community that's been called the Lost Generation. So along with Gertrude Stein, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ezra Pound, all these authors who were sort of uh, living in a shared community um, and are most often noted for uh, their exploring of modernist writing. So Hemingway became friends with uh, this group of authors and again they would associate with other influential artists and painters and it was, again, a supportive modernist uh, community of uh, writers and authors and artists. Um, so at this time, he also uh, befriended F. Scott Fitzgerald, who, is, who wrote uh, The Great Gatsby, as well as Ezra Pound. And he met Pablo Picasso. So again, it was a very sort of culturally uh, important moment in terms of the modernist movement. Um, so at this time, he again would continue. He eventually divorced his first wife and remarried after having an, a divorce, or an affair, and then he got divorced, and he would had a child. So he had a lot of sort of ups and downs in terms of his relationships with women, and we see a little bit of that, a little glimpse of that in uh, the short story that we're doing today. But he is, again, he was... A world traveler, so he spent time in Paris and Spain and China. Um, he was also a reporter during the world during World War II, and he uh, was at the D-Day landing. He was also given the Bronze Star for bravery. Later on in his life, his health suffered. His mental health and physical health sort of started to deteriorate, and he was struggling uh, with a severe uh, alcoholism. So with his health in decline in his old or age, he again, um, uh, he sort of, his physical and mental health worsened and eventually he would take his own life. So again, 
he had a very full, exciting, adventurous lifestyle, and his reputation as sort of this manly man uh, is, again, part of this grandeur of this uh, American author. So perhaps Hemingway is best known in terms of his writing style for very sort of minimalistic, sparse, um, journalistic style of writing. So what we can sort of use to describe his writing style is this idea of the iceberg theory. And this theory suggests that while there are sort of minimal surface details of the story, we have to sort of dig deeper and see what is beyond the words, beyond read between the lines, so to speak, and look at the larger symbolism, of uh, the details of the story. So the iceberg theory is again a way to describe Ernest Hemingway's style of writing and how sparse uh, his style is. So it uses minimal words, min very minimalistic style, and then it's our job as the reader, the audience, to look beyond the surface of the words to get at uh, the true sort of meaning or purpose, symbolism, uh, that lays beyond the surface of the story. In this regard, we can also understand the iceberg as a kind of theory of omission. So sometimes it's almost as important of what an author doesn't say as what he does say. So in this case of the short story, we have two characters talking about an awfully simple operation, right? They don't ever say the words abortion, but we know it is lying just below the surface of their dialogue. So I asked you guys to contemplate this question while you were reading the text. What is causing the tension between the young couple? What is the awfully simple operation that the American is alluding to? And what I wanted you to get out of that is, again, to read below the surface of the words, read between the lines, and again, understand that this the tension between this young couple is the fact that Jig is pregnant and the American is alluding to the fact that he wants her to go through with an abortion. She, on the other hand, is contemplating keeping the child. And this is, again, something that they are not talking openly about, but it's causing this underlying tension of their conversation while they wait at the train station for their train to come. If you have not done so already, please watch the short film that I posted on the course homepage. It is a dramatization of the story and I think it does do a really good job of representing the tension uh, that that's sort of buried in the words of the short story. So take a few minutes, watch the short film if you haven't already, and again, um, Think about you know, how the words, or how the meaning of the story goes beyond just the words on the page. So almost immediately when we first uh, start reading the story, the tension between this, the man and the woman, the American and Jig, um, is evident. Uh, almost immediately after Jig is, talks about the hills in the distance that look like white elephants. So we get a building of tension in the story that again continues throughout uh, the narrative and very little happens on the surface of the story, right? They're just waiting for a train. Nothing really happens except this conversation that they have. So it's our job as the readers to again dig deeper into the words and under uncover some of the hidden or underlying meaning uh, beyond their words. So if we look at the discussion that they're having, we can uncover that there is in fact a argument taking place and it has to do with the fact that Jig is pregnant and they have to make this decision, it's an imminent decision that they have to make uh, whether or not Jig will go through this quote-unquote awfully simple operation, uh, an abortion that the American wants her to get. So we're going to look more closely at some of the phrasing that the American does, or what he says, that reveal that he's in support of going through with this abortion operation. 
So I want you to highlight in your textbook and make note of any sort of glimpse where you get a, the sense of his true feelings in regards to what he wants Jig to do. So for instance, on page 166 of your textbook, you can see at the top of the page his use of describing the operation is awfully simple. Again, he has the sense of sort of minimizing and making it seem like a simple, natural operation um, that is not going to have sort of devastating consequences on Jig or, again, it's perfectly normal. So he's trying to minimize the effect that it might have on Jig. Um, so the way he describes the operation is going to be an important part, an important clue in understanding how his true feelings are sort of subtly represented. So this is one example. So he says it's really an awfully simple operation jig. It's not really an operation at all, right? So again, he's very he's minimizing the severity of what she would have to go through. And then he continues, I know you wouldn't mind it, jig. It's really not anything. It's just to let the air in. So he's using a, a euphemism there just to let the air in, right? He doesn't ever say abortion or um, the severity of what they're actually doing. He's using this sort of euphemistic, gentle way of describing uh, what would happen. And then he says, I'll go with you, I'll stay with you all the time, they just let the air in, and then it's all perfectly natural. Um, he promises her later that they'll be just the way that they were before, so their relationship will not change, will not be affected by this decision and they'll be perfectly happy if she goes through with this. So we get the repetition of the word perfectly simple, perfectly natural. Um, he says perfectly simple I think twice there on that page. So again, it's sort of minimizing, making it seem like a much more simple decision than it really is. So again, he's sort of minimizing powerful effect that this might have, that this decision would have on Jake's life. And he promises that they'll be happy again, right? So everything will be just the way it was. They'll be happy. They'll be able to travel and each enjoy each other's company. And they don't have to stop their lifestyle of drinking and kind of partying and looking at the sights. So they'll still be uh, just the way that they were before. And then we get a little bit more insight as this tension is building. Uh, we have this back and forth dialogue between Jig and the American. Uh, the American says we can have everything. Jig says no we can't. He says we can have the whole world. No we can't. We can go everywhere. And then Jig answers no we can't. It isn't ours anymore. Um, so again, we get the sense that she seems to realize the severity of this deci decision much more than he does. And she, again, understands that there is going to be dramatic consequences to this decision in regards to their relationship. And then finally, at the bottom of page 167, we get insight into how he really feels. So sometimes he says things like, you know, I don't want to do it if you don't want to do it. Um, we can do whatever you want, but at the same time he seems to reveal that he actually wants her to go through with this. So we get a sense of this at the bottom of page 167 when he says, um, she's asking him, please, 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 please stop talking. And then he goes and says, but I don't want you to, he said, I don't care anything about it. So she threatens to scream at this point. So this is the moment of highest tension, I think, in the story. Um, she's begging him to stop talking, and then he reveals, I don't care anything about it. So the it in that case, I think, is the unborn child. And uh, we can read more deeply into his words at this point and suggest that uh, he, in fact, wants Jig to go through with this operation.